This month on Focus Black Oklahoma, join us as we discuss Governor Stitt's recent executive order, which cuts funding for diversity, equity, and inclusion personnel, sparking debate about the future of these programs. Explore heat mapping in Oklahoma City with a team of scientists. Travel with an FBO correspondent to Palestine. And celebrate the vibrant hip hop scene of Tulsa's Greenwood District and hear about its musical pioneers. All this and more on Focus Black Oklahoma. Focus Black Oklahoma is sponsored by Phillips Seminary, welcoming Carrie Newcomer in concert January 25th at Harvard Avenue Christian Church in Tulsa. Learn more at wherefaithleads.com. This is Focus Black Oklahoma. I'm Jacob Littlebear. And I'm Kuma Roberts. Oklahoma Governor Kevin Stitt's recent executive order aims to cut state funding for diversity, equity, and inclusion personnel, sparking debate about the future of these programs. Oklahoma Democratic Chair and others believe part of the solution is ensuring more white men are speaking about the value of such programs, but not everyone agrees with this approach. Shonda Little has the story. On Monday night, former President Trump secured a resounding victory in the frigid Iowa caucus, amassing over 50 percent of the vote for the largest victory in caucus history. Iowans braved the negative wind chill to vocalize support for the former president in his 2024 race for the White House and, in doing so, made clear that the vast majority of the Republican Party's electorate supports Trump's war on all things that he perceives as woke. Straight in the crosshairs is diversity, equity, and inclusion programs, or DEI. Last month, on December 13th, 2023, Oklahoma Governor Kevin Stitt, a Republican receiving more notice on a national scale, held a press conference announcing Executive Order 2023-31 to end or limit Oklahoma taxpayer funds being used for non-critical personnel at Oklahoma's state agencies and public universities and colleges. At the podium, Stitt had a poster with, quote, defunding discrimination, end quote. The governor stood behind it and declared, quote, in Oklahoma, we're going to encourage equal opportunity rather than promising equal outcomes. Encouraging our workforce, economy, and education systems to flourish means shifting focus away from exclusivity and discrimination and toward opportunity and merit. We're taking politicians out of education and focusing on preparing students for the workforce, end quote. In application, Stitt's new executive order requires state agencies and institutes for higher education to perform a review of DEI positions, departments, activities, procedures, and programs to eliminate and dismiss non-critical personnel. Stitt further said the move was to prevent, quote, indoctrination, end quote, for college students. While Stitt's executive order was met with approving praise for much of his base and conservative media amid a contentious national election cycle, many professionals involved in DEI programs were left stunned and unsure what the end result would be, both in the short and long term. The chair of the Oklahoma Democratic Party, Alicia Andrews, a black woman from Tulsa who is a professional real estate agent, said she saw an opportunity to broaden the discussion. In mid-December, Andrews announced a diversity, equity, and inclusion panel hosted by the Oklahoma Democratic Party scheduled for December 19th at 6.30 p.m. On the public invitation, which was posted upon various social media platforms, were photos of five people. Former Oklahoma Governor David Walters and current Oklahoma State Representatives Mickey Dollins, John Waldron, Forrest Bennett, and Jacob Rosecrantz. The five men have a few things in common. They are all Democrats. They all fall into the middle class or higher economically. They are all male. They are all straight. They are all Christian. They are all white. But Andrews points out her motivation for making them headliners. They all are or have been elected into Oklahoma's government 
and use their privileges to be fervent supporters of DEI programs. Andrew admits that she was touting controversy in the hopes of gaining attention and engagement from the public, but adds that the panel was also made up of several DEI professionals who also happen to be minorities, 2SLGBTQIA, or members of other marginalized communities. She believes these white male leaders and other white male leaders must be included in the conversation to productively move forward. So when the governor announced, you know, his ban on diversity, I thought it was important that the Oklahoma Democratic Party be seen having a conversation or taking some action related to that. And so I was having a conversation with the president of Young Democrats of Oklahoma, and she was planning one as well. And I had the idea, okay, great, let's combine these, right? She had some professionals in the DEI space. And, you know, as a woman of color, I think it is important just to say in stark words what is happening. And frankly, all racism, all conversation starts with white people. Andrew says the objective was to give her constituents and undecided voters alike the chance to hear from lawmakers who will be taking up the DEI mantle when the new legislative session begins in February, while also gaining guidance from black, brown, non-male, and gay DEI professionals advocating for DEI values. So I thought, you know what, I think it'll be a great idea if we talk about this from a different angle. If we have a bunch of white legislators, people who are in a position to actually affect change, the first question I was going to ask was, okay, you are all straight white men. Talk to me about what you lose when we have DEI programs. How, how, why are people afraid of DEI programs? Because frankly, white people listen to white people. Boil it down, say it any other kind of way. I admit that I was also trying to be provocative. I wanted folks to tune in and see what angle we were going to take. It was not going to be some conversation where diversity, equity, inclusion, and people of color and people of different religions and people of different gender identities and all that kind of stuff were going to be left out of the conversation. But if we don't truly address the issue of privilege, we're just going to keep talking in circles about DEI. Because the folks who are making the decisions about shutting down DEI don't look like me. They look like straight white men. Not long after the Oklahoma Democratic Party announced its DEI panel, a profile on the social media platform X, formerly Twitter, that focuses on Oklahoma politics, criticized the lack of diverse faces on the panel's invitation. It went viral with stories being picked up by multiple statewide and national media publications. The panel did continue, but criticism was wide ranging and attendance was marred. Ultimately, the lawmakers all backed out. Me, a woman of color, facilitating a conversation, asking the tough questions of, of white guys, 15 minutes of the DEI professionals talking, and then another 30 minutes of all of those folks having the conversation. Clearly, my marketing failed <laughs> because I got lambasted. I still think that it was, I, I feel like it was a missed opportunity. I still think that it was a conversation worth having and a perspective worth hearing from. Representative Jacob Rosecrans is a public school teacher who represents Oklahoma's 46th House District in the state legislature. He was also a panel member for that conversation on DEI. He says he is dedicated to expanding educational opportunities for all his constituents and Oklahoma residents, regardless of their racial, gender, religious, or socioeconomic backgrounds. He says he was also excited to learn more about the need for DEI from expert professionals and everyday Oklahomans. I don't know what, what it is they have against uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion programs. Uh, it's, it's become kind of a far-right dog whistle, you know? I mean, if you remember back with the CRT scare is what I call it, just real hardcore fear-mongering that's directed towards a certain portion of the GOP voting base. That's why I think these things are happening. Although Rose Krantz and his legislative colleagues ultimately withdrew from the DEI panel, he still defends Andrew's objective 
and believes the panel could have been a positive conversation in the right direction. Alicia Andrews has done a great job. When this all went down, she really wanted to, to make sure that we had a, a good, deep conversation about DEI programs in general. And she wanted it from the perspective of elected officials and from the perspective of white elected men elected officials. And and it's almost like a reverse psychology idea, I think, that she had. I liked the idea because I have so much to learn about diversity and inclusion and, and equity that I want to be involved as much as I possibly can, including having tough conversations and to talk about my own privilege. And, and that's what I really thought I was going to go on there and do, along with the rest of what turned into a kind of a DEI panel. This, uh, this idea makes sense when you hear me talk about it. And when we have the conversations like we did with Alicia, it all made sense. Now, what happens is that we live in a social media world. And then somebody got a screenshot of these white dudes just chilling for the diversity, uh, the DEI uh, panel. And that went basically viral. And it's the world we live in. We live in a memeified world. And it's a sad thing sometimes because you, you sometimes lose the importance of what what the original idea w- was. And that's what happened. So uh, all of us on the uh, the panel decided to back out just because again, it had already gotten so negative and there's no reason to have a negative conversation about that. And also we wanted to focus on the voices that are marginalized. And that was the thing that was also part of this panel. It just wasn't uh, presented as that way. Both Andrews and Rosecrans have refocused on introducing new efforts to protect and expand the principles of DEI in Oklahoma. Both say that the alternative would be too dire for Oklahomans and the state's economic development. I fear that Oklahoma is going to become this island where people don't come here and where our young people can't escape because they're not going to be prepared to compete elsewhere. They're going to be here in this world, not knowing the language and the inner workings of DEI and not be able to participate equally in other states that do recognize and practice inclusion and equity and acknowledging diversity. I fear that we're going to be this island who cannot compete. For Focus Black Oklahoma, I'm Shonda Little in Cheyenne. During the summer of 2023, Oklahoma experienced its highest heat index ever recorded, 126 degrees Fahrenheit. One technique scientists are using to learn how best to adapt to climate change is called heat mapping. Last summer, Brittany Cordera joined a team of scientists on a heat mapping project in Oklahoma City, and now the findings and analysis have been released. Here's Brittany with details. The weather was less than favorable for a community-driven project that maps the urban heat island effect in Oklahoma City. Volunteers walked around the city and drove in their cars to collect data on heat and air quality. It was a rare cooler day in August, temperatures hovered around 87 degrees, and it was cloudy and rainy most of the day. But the rain didn't discourage Sarah Terry Cobo, the city's associate planner for the Office of Sustainability. She woke up at 4 a.m. to get the heat mapping campaign started for the day. Urban heat islands, and it's totally raining today. Right. Makes for great radio. And it's really unusual for a late August for it to be raining like this. Yep. We do all the planning, we do everything that we can, but we can't control the weather, so we just have to go with it. Terry Kobo pulled out her phone to take images of parking lots, sidewalks, and even the OKC streetcar using a consumer grade thermal imaging device attached to her iPhone. She's surprised by the temperature differences between the concrete sidewalk and the prairie habitat at Myriad Botanical Gardens. Places that were cooler showed up as purple and blue, while hotter places were orange, yellow, and red. And oh, look at this. I just love the contrast with the sidewalk at 92 degrees, 93 degrees, and then this big old, maybe it's a spruce, I'm not sure, at 85. I mean, it's not a lot, but... So what we're seeing right now in the Myriad Gardens is um, a great example of a potential cooling strategy for urban heat islands. The heat mapping project, funded by NOAA and spearheaded by the Climate Adaptation Planning and Analytics Heat Watch, also known as CAPA, 
and local organizations has been active since 2017 to collect data on how parking lots and buildings can amplify the impacts of extreme heat while bringing awareness to the uneven distribution of green spaces in cities. Terry Kobo says the urban heat island effect impacts areas of Oklahoma where there is uneven distribution of trees. These areas, she says, tend to be historically redlined. There's definitely a swath um, kind of going, pointing northeast, east of Interstate 35, where you've got more trees, but that's in areas that are undeveloped. That's not necessarily in some of the um, neighborhoods because on the northeast side of town and the east side in general is historically redlined. The rain continued throughout the day. Thunderstorms rolled into the afternoon when Hong Guan Lee, an assistant professor in the College of Public Health at OU, her daughter, and Amy Matlin Dixon, a PhD student at OU's School of Meteorology, picked up their equipment from Pitt's Recreation Center. It's a very like street or community science, like everyone can be the street scientist. Install this in the car and measure the air quality and the heat stress. I rode along with them that afternoon. Lee says this community-driven work is important to get a whole picture of the impacts extreme heat and air quality have on the city. We want to take a deeper look for the heat stress, uh, like in the communities. The community-based is the um, most, I would say, most appropriate way to um, understand the heat stress better. The average temperature for August across the U.S. was 2.3 degrees above average. It ranks as the ninth warmest August in the nearly 130 years of recorded data. Terry Cobo says 4% of Oklahoma City's 621 square miles is parking lots. One thing she hopes this data could help with is to show the impact parking lots can have on the neighborhoods near them and lead to changes in the required amount of parking spaces per business. The other great part about this research and the expanded funding that we receive from our partners allows us to do what's called a jurisdictional scan and an intervention guidebook. That will kind of identify, oh, if there is a particular law that stands in the way of us getting rid of parking minimums. Once the data is processed, the intervention guidebook could provide a roadmap for the city to tackle solutions to extreme heat. Solutions like where to plant more trees, restore natural habitat, and install cooling shelters and enclosed bus stops. Kappa says the results for the project should be ready by late October or mid-November. Hung Wan Lee attaches two devices to the windows of her car. She and her daughter are helping researchers on this rainy August day to take air quality and temperature readings around Oklahoma City. Lee researches air quality at the University of Oklahoma. Last year, Oklahoma City joined over a dozen cities in a national heat mapping project. Community members, just like Lee, helped record data that could be used to help cities understand the impacts of extreme heat. The data collected last August showed downtown Oklahoma City was 15 degrees hotter than the suburbs. I'm walking through my neighborhood near downtown. I was surprised to find out that this area with its giant sycamore trees got pretty warm last summer. Terry Cobo says my neighborhood, Mesta Park, was one of the hottest areas in Oklahoma City. The more affluent area and has a lot of um, older tree canopy that's intact. That is still pretty hot and compared to some of these other neighborhoods that we were expecting to be very hot. Trees don't always provide enough cooling. That's because heat gets trapped in roofs, roads, and sidewalks. It creates what's called the urban heat island effect. Cooling strategies are what can come from understanding the hottest parts of urban areas. Last summer, 14 cities, including Oklahoma City, worked with NOAA and citizen scientists to map where the urban heat islands are. Joey Williams is with Kappa Heat Watch. The program provides the equipment for the urban heat island project and the results. William says the project started in 2017 and helped cities make plans for how to address extreme heat. As the threat of heat continues to rise and people become more aware that heat is an issue and life-threatening and it affects different people differently, having this just kind of awareness that it's an issue can be a lifesaver. Sustainability offices in cities are taking the results from last summer's mapping to develop ways to adapt to heat. Kansas City, Missouri has already done this, using its past data to show where it lacked tree canopy. Andy Savastino with the City Sustainability Office says the heat mapping helped inform a new policy. Anytime a developer wants to come in, particularly into areas where you've got old uh, forest growth, our tree preservation ordinance, uh, which we never had one before, now applies so that there is some requirement for developers to replace some percentage of what they take down. 
Oklahoma City's heat mapping campaign found the city needs more trees and less parking lots to help cool off neighborhoods. And the city is working on a guidebook this year to help leaders figure out the best ways to adapt to extreme heat, like changing parking zoning laws or restoring natural habitat. For Focus Black Oklahoma, I'm Brittany Cordera in Oklahoma City. You're listening to Focus Black Oklahoma. Would you like to pitch a story to FBO or work with us as a correspondent? Please email us at contact at focusblackoklahoma.com. Since the October 7 Hamas terrorist attack in Israel, the Israeli Defense Forces ongoing campaign in Gaza has dominated headlines around the world. The conflict has elicited polarized reactions across the globe, including here in Oklahoma. One FBO correspondent visited Israel and Palestine and shares his perspective based on his personal experience. Here's written Quincy. The story first begins January 11, 2023. I was extended the opportunity to study abroad through Phillips Theological Seminary, and the immersion experience was required to complete my master's degree. My program is a master's of art in social justice, and the Palestine-Israel immersion opportunity was one that I did not and I could not pass up. The emphasis of learning on the ground in the Middle East was intensive documentation of the perspectives of Palestinians and Israelis working in various aspects of the country and the state. Weeks leading up to our journey, we were given books to read, suggested videos to watch, some news broadcasts, documentaries, music, videos, and the like. We would meet periodically through Zoom as some of us who were taking this pilgrimage did not live in Oklahoma. We were warned through weekly correspondence and daily as our departure got closer, that at any time, if because of the looming post-pandemic of COVID-19 or more urgently, that if the climate on the ground changed, for our safety, the trip would be delayed or canceled. The statement was always made matter-of-factly, with no space for questioning. Fortunately, our United Airlines flight stayed on schedule. We landed 14 hours east of the United States in a land we were taught to know about. Expectations of biblical imagery, expectations of political imagery, expectations of social representation that was to fit an image that the Western media painted. We, I, was met with none of the aforementioned. Our host gathered us together and explained what we should expect before we made our way to Customs and through Ben-Gurion Airport. The instructions were simple and to not deviate. State, I am here on pilgrimage to tour the Holy Land, period. Nothing more, nothing less. We understood the instructions. Everyone understood. Everyone followed. Shortly after, our group and everyone traveling on our flight were met with a military presence that echoed an alert. The uniforms, bulletproof vest, and machine guns silently spoke a language of their own. But me, I interpreted. There was a line. The line was explicit and tacit. The line was invisible, yet easy to see. It was apparent that that line had been crossed. It was apparent that there was an anticipation and angst for it to be crossed again. We were present to study the line discreetly, with respect for those who drew the line, lived on both sides of the line, those who died crossing it, those who died trying to erase it, and those who died retracing it. Lord of human rights, I chose to resist against the Israeli occupation, choosing international law, doing the work of advocacy work, Um, but sadly, as a Palestinian, regardless what you use to resist this occupation, you will be called a terrorist. If it's a pen or a paper, if it's a stone by a child, or if it's an M16, regardless, you'll be a terrorist. That is a clip of a briefing with Milena Ansari of Adamir Prisoner Support and Human Rights Association in Ramallah, Palestine, which is situated in the West Bank. The significance of my visit and the meeting with Melina January the 11th culminates nine months later, October the 7th, when Hamas reignited the nearly 80-year-old conflict that has remained ablaze since Zionists occupied Palestinian territory during the Nakba, where in 1948, 
More than 700,000 Palestinian Arabs were forced to flee from their homes and were expelled. At this same time, almost one million Jews were expelled from Algeria, Egypt, Iraq, Libya, Morocco, Syria, and Yemen. It is present day that this generation has witnessed the deadliest times of the conflict where in 2023 alone, approximately 1,200 Israelis and at least 17,700 Palestinians have been killed in 64 days as of December 9th, 2023. As a result of the tension reaching the height of volatility, international supporters of the Palestinian plight have organized across the globe. Millions have amassed to demonstrate in opposition to the apartheid enforced by the State of Israel in the forms of rallies, protests, marches, and demonstrations. Of these acts of civil disobedience, many supporters are Jewish organizations who are in allyship with Palestine. Locally, Oklahomans Against Occupation has organized peaceful rallies and educational forums for Palestine in both Oklahoma City and Tulsa. Attendees are encouraged to show solidarity with Palestine through signs, flags, and kufiyas. Back in November, I ran into a longtime friend, Dylan O'Carroll, at a rally at Tulsa City Hall. Dozens of people whose ages ranged from toddler to seasoned elder stood shoulder to shoulder chanting, From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. I had not seen Dylan in some time. He knew I had traveled to the Middle East from following me on Instagram. He may have liked one of my posts, but we hadn't had the chance to talk in person because of, you know, life. Ironically, we happened to be at the same rally, but not because of happenstance. We needed to keep the conversation going. We met a few days ago. Dylan, a.k.a. JYD, Junkyard Dog, explained his connection. My great-grandfather, Irving Zeff, he immigrated from Palestine as a teenager to Detroit. So okay. some would consider him to be in diaspora. His family had lived there for a long time. He is actually a, what they consider to be a Palestinian Jew, which is a phrase that was very commonplace as far as my understanding goes at that time. It was a, under that time, he was born and raised in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, as far as my understanding is, there was some tensions between people, but not about land, right? right. right. It wasn't it's about, about like, it was, sharing was, was commonplace, right? Yeah. Like, if there was tension, it was not about, like, you don't belong here. You could be Jewish. You could, you could worship in, in the temples of your God. Mm -hmm. And... That was the case pretty much for Muslims and Christians as well. Like there's always been, a, like if you ever talk to someone who practices Islam, they'll always say Jesus Christ and the practice of Judaism is a, like respected in the Quran, right? Like that's a very like specific thing that they will say. Mm -hmm. So this version of Jerusalem, of Palestine, where my great grandfather was born and raised, that there was, people got along. Not to be reductive, like, to say, like, yeah, people got along. And if there were tensions, it wasn't, like, it, they did not mirror the, or reflect the tensions that are there now because the tensions that are there now are created by international conflict. They're created by international bodies. They're created by colonialism. Dylan further explains his understanding of Zionism from his Palestinian Jewish descent, even after being influenced by his dad who adopted Zionism not from his grandfather, but from a Western ideological interpretation of how Jews and diasporic Jews should be positioned. He dives into the surface of this complex thought. I think it's a living practice in Jewish culture, though. I think it's a living practice in Jewish culture based on an ideology that, like, as you said, was crafted by intelligentista, right? Like, mm -hmm. that was influenced, like, up, upper, like, Power, like you know, people in really elite power, like yeah. power circles. And I don't, want, I don't want to block their blessings, right? And here's the thing: 
those folks who are living in diaspora, right, they're from mm-hmm. the Levant. Like, there's many people who are, like, we're living in Austria, who are living in, in Hungary, who are living right. in Poland, who are living in France, who are right. living, like, their ancestors came from the Levant. Right. So, I am even for the idea of folks moving back to the Levant, Israel, Palestine, like, that place in like f- like that should be encouraged like you want to move back there move back there there should be no borders there should be no like there like that should be welcome it should be accepted right that was not what was happening though right. that what was happening was there were structures put in place to remove violently remove people from land the depth of this conversation continued for nearly an hour an hour that could easily extend three generations in length we did not reach a solution and nor did we attempt to however As the two of us sat and reflected on where the state of the conflict is today and where we as Westerners living in the United States, both descendants of a people who have suffered, both citizens of an empire who itself has perpetuated the ills of colonialism, not to mention economically supported the oppression of Palestinians, Dylan concludes. Like we learned the Holocaust as a way of alongside of learning like black slavery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the, the intersect between the the black oppression in the United States and Jewish uh, oppression in Europe. Jewish oppression in Europe. So that's I get that intersection, and so I'm I have I now have this like this mindset of okay, like there are people who are working against forces, and these forces are similar, <laughs> and they're around the world. It's a shock to so many people in the generations above me that Israel could be in the position of oppressor. The only way you could see Israel as an oppressor is if you learned in one of two ways, right? As or as my great grandfather's experience of being a Palestinian Jew, right? Who's like, yo, this is not how the, like we're operating as an oppressor. Or as someone who learned about oppression, right? In the, in, in the sort of context that I did, you know, or many other people did at Carver Middle School where you're learning about it as a, like a sort of global working, right? White supremacy, Nazis want to kill Jews, like slavery, like black people want to be, in, like need to be enslaved, Jim Crow, like so you learn it in this like sort of melting pot context of American history and like, like cal- you know, or not just American history, but you learn it in this like melting pot context, right? I have that perspective. Also, my father was Irish. He grew up with that same sort of context Mm -hmm. and understanding of like globalized oppression Mm -hmm. because the Irish have been oppressed for 800 years by the British. So like he was giving me like, yo, if it's rocks versus rockets, you're always on the side of the rocks. For Focus Black Oklahoma, I'm Rick Quincy in Tulsa. Joy Harvey and Shavonda Pinnell, two Black women with gaps in their teeth, share their experiences of self-acceptance in a society that often overlooks such features. Their stories emphasize the need for broader inclusivity and recognition in beauty standards, highlighting the slow but growing acceptance of diverse physical attributes. Francia Allen shares more. Women of color have often had to fight for their cultural forms of beauty to be embraced, valued, and represented in the United States. This has been especially true for Black women. Despite the centuries of politics regarding Black women, their beauty has created a sense of sisterhood among the multifaceted women who come in many shades, shapes, and sizes. However, women with gaps are often not included or mentioned in the conversations surrounding beauty in these spaces. In fact, representation is severely lacking. When there is no room at the table for us, our stories go unheard. Every woman has a coming-of-age story about how they found their self-confidence. Unfortunately, women with gaps are never asked about their journeys and experiences growing up in a society where gaps are considered unattractive. Many dentists treat it as a birth defect that needs to be fixed. Although gaps are slowly becoming more acceptable in today's society than they were years ago, they are still not a focus of celebration. Joy Harvey of Harvey's Detail Connection, a car detailing company, and Dr. Shavonda Pinnell, the only black chiropractic physician in North Tulsa, share their experience as women with gaps. First, we hear from Joy, then Dr. Pinnell. 
being a woman with a gap has been almost like a double edged sword Mm -hmm. because on one edge, it's like you love it because that's who you are. And on the other edge, it's like, I'm tired of this. Like, I wish I never had it. So I growing up, like it is nothing that I can do because I'm born with it. Growing up, I felt like embarrassed. It, it kind of hurt my confidence a little bit. For my family, it was always a more uplifting thing. It was never something to be made a, a big deal about. It was mm. like, we have gaps and that's it. Okay. So, but it was never, I was, I was never made to feel amongst my family like my gap wasn't beautiful. Like it wasn't a part of me. The technical terminology for the gap in our front teeth is called a maxillary midline diastema, according to Sepakor Ayiaku and Brian Miller from the International Dental Journal 73. In their study, maxillary midline diastemas in West African smiles, these dentists pointed out that 22.33% of people have diastemas with a higher occurrence in the Black population. 36% of Black people have developmental causes such as smaller teeth, muscle attachment to the upper ridge, impacted teeth, trauma, periodontal disease, and artificial design, while only 3.5% of white people are affected by these. Those most impacted are between the ages of 12 and 18. Dr. Ayuku and Dr. Miller also discovered that in West African culture, women with gaps are viewed as beautiful, powerful, as well as persons of great abundance. Historically, Africans have always celebrated this attribute in women. Sometimes it's good to let science and history speak for themselves in these matters. Being a Black woman with a gap, I know all too well the journey of feeling different and doubting my beauty as a young girl because I was the only person in my family and friend group with the gap. No one in my home environment ever affirmed or validated my gap. In fact, my mother reported that my father and paternal grandmother both had gaps and later closed them. In her concern for my self-image, she considered closing mine, but because it was too expensive, she decided not to. I spent years hiding my smile because I felt embarrassed, especially in school pictures. As I got older, I started participating in activities that empowered me to embrace and define my own sense of beauty, like attending modeling school and attempting to get into fashion design. I was determined to blaze my own trail, even if no one thought I was pretty enough. The only representation I saw that inspired me was a white model named Lauren Hutton, who recently closed her gap. Here's Dr. Pinnell, then Joy. Who I am today, I wasn't the same person mm, five years ago. Mm. I, I mean, honestly, maybe three years ago. I've just come into a, a, a state of self-awareness and really self-love. Uh-huh. Just Love three that. years ago. Yeah, like, I mean, beautiful. yeah, I mean, and honestly, I mean, I'm comfortable with who I am. Like, raw, no makeup, like, teeth, everything, like, mm-hmm. just now mm-hmm. at 37. So for me, I try to, I, I'm very controlling. So I try to make sure that I am instilling that in my kids now, even at a young age. I have a seven-year-old daughter and a nine-year-old son. I'm actually still finding my beauty. It sounds real crazy, but I am just now at a point to where I find myself falling in love with myself. I've never been in love with myself. There's things, you know, you go to the mirror, you look at all your imperfections and you wish to change those imperfections. And so you just keep beating yourself down about those imperfections. And now I'm at a state to where I'm being very intentional with my thought process, with the words that I say to myself. Um, I talk to myself in the mirror to inspire myself because I am joy unapologetically. And if you like it, you like it. If you don't, hey, that's your problem. It ain't got nothing to do with me. And so I love my who I am, who I'm becoming. I love my gap and I love everything about myself now. Joy and Dr. Pinnell discuss what it felt like having people in their environment who made them feel secure with their smiles. Not everyone has that support, but when you do, it means a world of difference. It's even more important for little girls with gaps, as well as adults, to see representation of people who look like us. It's always very disappointing to see a celebrity come into the entertainment business with a gap and then close it. Joy speaks to this first 
Then Dr. Pinnell chimes in. I remember I was at Wilson and I hated reading. And uh, my teacher, one of my teachers, you know, you always find that one teacher that takes time to get you where you need to go. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was like, hey, listen to this book. And I was like, listen to this book. I want to say it was I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings. Oh, okay. Maya Angelou. Yeah. And I looked at it and I looked at her and I was like, I want to say she has a gap. I was like, wow. And so I started, it made me more attracted to the book because she looked like me. I've never seen anybody with a gap that was black, that looked like me. So that was actually my first interaction with someone that looked like me, had the gap like me and inspired me because that book was amazing. I never heard it was, I never heard it talked about besides it just referring to me having a gap like my aunts. And then I, my aunt, my aunt love who I'm really close with, she did a very good job of making me feel good about my gap. It would be like, your gap is cute. Like, you look cute. Like, I got a gap and I'm cute. You know, so it was more like of an uplifting thing. Yeah. yeah. Like, and I even with that. my mom, my mom never made me, if she talked about my gap, she would say like, like, look, it's like his cute gap. Like, it's cute. Like, mm-hmm. it's a cute thing. Dr. Pinnell and Joy share a message for other women and little girls with gaps. Wholeheartedly, unconditionally, love yourself. Be so confident and in tune with who you are and self-aware of who you are that you can have the opportunity to actually embrace your beauty with your gap. Because your gap is beautiful. Like, just because somebody else does not have one, that doesn't mean that you are different or you are the eyeball out. I would say... Be you unapologetically. God made you who you are, and he knew the person that you would become before you even knew it. Um, Your gap is what makes you beautiful. Your gap is what makes you special. Your gap is you. For Focus Black Oklahoma, I'm Francia Allen in Tulsa. Tulsa's Greenwood District is a burgeoning epicenter of hip-hop led by artists like Mr. Burns, Manifest Greatness, and Nine Milla. Each with decades in the scene, they blend personal struggles with creative expression, shaping Tulsa's hip-hop legacy and cultural identity. Anthony Cherry tells us the story of these local musical pioneers. Some of the world's most promising rappers can be found performing regularly in the historic Greenwood District in Tulsa, Oklahoma. From battling societal norms to breaking through industry barriers, three artists shared their talented voices to help shape our city's hip-hop scene. They delved into the challenges they faced and the triumphs they've celebrated on their journey from the dive bars of Tulsa to the international world of hip-hop. So I can even take it back to when I first hit the scene. Um, I was just doing battles. I was just going from um, like project to project, like Apache, Normandy, Comanche. Mr. Burns, also known as Earl Hazard, has been on the Greenwood hip hop scene since 2000. The former frontman of the local band Freak Juice speaks on the early days of his career when he decided to take the risk to invest in himself and his talents. So oh, you, yeah, you, yeah. You were a lot yeah. more invested before you put your voice we, out there. Yeah. yeah, we had to buy our own CDs and stuff like that, you know, and print them ourselves. And so, like, I did the artwork, you know what I mean? So I drew up the artwork on paper. We scanned it. You know, we got it printed off. But we went through disc makers. We had to order the CDs. We had to sit there and print them ourselves, you know, printing five to ten CDs at one time. And we're printing 500 to 1,000 CDs, you know, like, but just making the beat sampling, you know, we did floppy disk. Burns' investment into himself eventually began to pay off. Getting shows. And then when I started getting shows and getting bigger, getting paid for shows, you know, I had, and then especially after I had my, my first son and I started having more kids and, uh, you know, just being able to feed my family doing this because I have fed my family doing music, touring and all that. 
just really making my mark. I love you, love it when you come through. We can chop it up like Bruce and the Kung Fu. Maybe did I fuck up, well maybe time's a cut full. But held on to the right though, the Manifest Greatness has been on the Greenwood rap scene since 1996. His devotion for his craft is rooted deeply in love. I think for me, um, I had a curveball thrown at me real early in life. Um, right after high school, I got married. My wife was shot and killed. So for me, uh, there's a lot of stuff that's blocked out, but it was just a struggle. Just It was more for the love for me because it, it's what kept me out of the pen, you know, out of just doing something crazy. The music is just, it kept me calm. I wasn't really trying to make money like that off of it, man. It was just for the love, you know, and if that came, it came. Cause I'm a leader. I don't fall in the pack. You don't move like I move. I'm where the money is at. And if you ain't talking money, I ain't hollering back. I'm Nine Miller is an Oklahoma native with 12 albums in his discography. He has been producing, marketing, and distributing music since 1994. When I got in, it, it was, uh, it's hard to get radio play at that time. Most of your promotion was done by foot. You know, like now you can push the buttons, which it is lovely. You know what I mean? But I'm just saying, like, I got most of my eyes. I was, I was out the trunk, state to state. So I got to see a lot of the world and live off my music. Yeah, it shook a lot of hands, made a lot of fans face to face. Nine Miller credits the Greenwood and larger Oklahoma rap scene with saving his very life. I feel like him and like kept me out the penitentiary because I changed my ways and a lot of my thinking. I started that journey. I had to go on and complete it, like make it happen. I wasn't going to get sidestepped no more. And then I seen a lot of my friends uh, catch them cases and do a long time. I started selling me in plastic packages. And that's, you know, that was, I was my new sack. So we made that CD, <laughs> wrapped it up, and I got my uh, units from uh, Canada put them in the trunk, and, and left. Nine Miller reflects how the industry he has devoted himself to has evolved. And that he helped, and that helped. Most people's out the trunk and just word of mouth and playing it a lot around here and moving on the highways the best you could. You know, now nowadays, you know, with the a lot of people get to go on the YouTube and stuff like that, but you didn't have all them avenues back then, so it was hard. It was hard. And... Uh, a computer and a mic didn't make a studio back then. You was with the two-inch reels, the four-inch reels, and, and the really slicing them and, and cutting and stuff like that. So, it, you know, when you see somebody come from old days, they put in lots and lots and lots of work to where it is now. That you might can go viral overnight just because somebody, you can't touch that many years in one night. Greenwood rap almost did not survive a 2008 tragedy. Burns reflects on how the loss of the life of a local artist impacted the community. I remember February 15, 2008, my guy Grimy, Philip Greer, rest in peace, it was a Rashida concert, and he got killed. And after that, that's when the curfew uh, started with the bars and the clubs and stuff. They started shutting down at 2 instead of like 3 and 4. And then like after that, it wasn't anybody trying to book hip-hop. Opportunities dried up significantly for hip-hop artists following this tragic event, but all hope was not lost. Many Tulsa rappers continued to grind, network, and persevere until hope came knocking. Here's Burns. The punk kids would let us get their last 15, 20 minutes while they packing up. We would hook up our phones and stuff like that and rap. And then next thing you know, we started getting booked and we started getting paid. Like, we didn't even know we was able to get paid for that. So... We started booking our own shows. And then um, after that, that's downtown started picking up. And then we started having all the OGs come down and do shows because it really wasn't a spot that anybody knew of that could exhibit our, our talent. Man, that was one of my big successes. Like not, not the money, not the accolades and all that. It was the work that I put in, the opportunities that I helped made for the artists now and the artists to come. Despite mountains of obstacles set before them over the years, proud successes also color the careers of these local artists. Manifest Greatness shares his thoughts. Man, I think some of my successes, man, was just some of the music that I was able to do. Just being able to get out there and rock with some of the nastiest MCs. 
I still got a long ways to go because I got a lot of individuals that I like to get down with, man. But I've opened up for people like KRS-One, you know what I'm saying? And that's an, a, that's an achievement for me right there. According to Burns, the future of Greenwood rap culture looks bright and shiny. The future looks like we're going to finally, here in a few years, I'll say I'll give it five, we're going to internationally be recognized as a mecca speaking on that. I'm, I'm currently working on a script for a documentary called Mecca in the Middle, and I'm going to be going all the way back to the beginning of, you know, I'm going to be talking about Greenwood, the race massacre, the jazz scene. It's a documentary about Tulsa hip hop. Burns alludes to much more than good music on the horizon. Movies, cinematics, big tours, festivals. I heard it's, it's some big festivals that's coming next year. You know, I ain't gonna say I can't say too much, but it's, it's some big things coming, man. Tulsa hip hop has been through a lot and we deserve every bit of success that, that is on its way. Nine Miller, with a spirit of gratitude, reflects on the longevity he has had in this industry. You get out what you put into it. If you if you put the work in, you're going to get the success you're looking for. But if you have, that's what you're going to get. So I, I can't complain. You know, even though I might not have been where somebody else feels successful, if you eat off your talents, <laughs> that's pretty successful. You know what I'm saying? And excess right there. If you can buy you some clothes, take care of your princess, you know, pay your bills, well, you just consider uh, what you call success, you know. If you can eat off your talent and live and pay bills, that's successful. Greenwood's rap tapestry is dynamic, weaving together stories of struggle, triumph, and relentless pursuit of cultural expression. Burns, Manifest Greatness, Nine Miller, and others have not only given their lives to mastering their craft, but also to building a significant legacy in the historic Greenwood district. Supporting local artists is foundational to an ever-evolving Greenwood music culture. For Focus, Black Oklahoma, I'm Anthony Cherry in Tulsa. Focus Black Oklahoma is produced in partnership with KOSU Radio and Tri-City Collective. Additional support is provided by the Commemoration Fund. Our theme music is by Moffat Music. Focus Black Oklahoma's executive producers are Karesh Ali Lantana and Bracken Clark. Our associate producers are Sprithi Iyengar and Jesse Ulrich. You can visit us online at kosu.org or tricitycollective.com slash focus dash black dash Oklahoma and on YouTube at Tricity Collective. You can follow us on Instagram at Focus Black OK and on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Focus Black OK. You can hear Focus Black Oklahoma on demand for free at KOSU.org, the NPR app, NPR.org, or wherever you get your podcasts. Did you know KOSU accepts vehicles as a form of support? You get a tax deduction and we'll take care of the rest. Visit KOSU.org or call 855 877-2346.